These are uh, details from the website of Prophecy, a company that makes event-based sensors. Here's the specifications on some of their sensors. Uh, you see that the pixel count is, is not high. Um, that's because the, there's a substantial complexity in the pixel. Each pixel is capable of uh, detecting a temporal event and filtering and time stamping it and sending it out. And what this means is that the, uh, sys the uh, sensor, image sensor is much more complex than a uh, conventional image sensor. Uh, Prophecy has uh, you know, the basic concept to write in the sense that, uh, as we'll discuss today, uh, frame-based measurement is not really consistent with modern computational imaging. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, pixel-based measurement is, is also not quite the right way to do electronic temporal sampling. Hopefully there'll be continuing evolution in this space uh, to make uh, better and more innovative sensors. Prophecy's idea is based on an analogy with uh, the human visual system and the claim that uh, humans uh, see uh, or process event-based uh, data. That's kind of an oversimplification, though, because there is some event-based triggering in biological systems, but we also see static scenes efficiency, efficiently. What you see, of course, is that the visual cortex, the human processing system, is extremely complex and embedded uh, with feature detection of multiple types and multiple levels. It will be wonderful to see uh, uh, electronic imaging systems to evolve to similar sorts of uh, cortex. But the uh, sensor, the image sensor, is not actually the main problem. Here's a simple uh, sketch of what happens in an image sensor from the website of uh, Lucid. You see we have pixels. Uh, we read out the pixels into processing on row based uh, systems. If we think about the, you know, the efficiency and challenges in, in camera systems, uh, the power uh, used to read out uh, the rows in, a, in an image sensor is a small fraction of the overall operating power of a camera. Most of the power goes into the um, image uh, signal processing and readout uh, circuitry that encodes the, uh, the image data. So the innovation in, uh, in temporal processing is likely to come at the edge where we can build more sophisticated processing that would be shared across uh, groups of pixels. But definitely moving towards some more sophisticated feature-based uh, measurement is attractive. Uh, today we're going to talk, uh, as we did with uh, spectral imaging, about how we might like to sample the space-time data cube. Computational imaging. Episode 66, Electronic Sampling for Temporal Imaging. Episodes 64 and 65 looked at uh, sampling strategies for the spatial spectral data cube and the space-time data cube with, uh, with mechanical or optical modulation. So we can look at the data cube as a slice with a space in this direction and time in this direction with the cacti coded aperture systems we looked at in episode uh, 65. Uh, this, we had this modulation at each pixel level as a function of time, and then we integrated it along the time axis. We could do something similar electronically where we could modulate uh, uh, the temporal response of each pixel and alias high frequency components into lower frequency measurements uh, with the electronic modulation. Um, that would be interesting, but as you see, actually, with the event camera uh, system, making changes to temporal sampling is, is difficult. Uh, Prophecy is raised over $130 million to make a particular kind of uh, very simple temporal modulation sampling um, to make to, to change the electronic sampling uh, takes a multi-million dollar investment to make a, a new uh, pixel sampling strategy. Uh, I think it's, that's a good idea. It would be better to be more imaginative about it, uh, but it, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, standard sensors are limited to sampling strategies that look like this. We have the, the global strat strategy uh, where at a particular time uh, all of the pixels integrate and then uh, there's a readout phase where uh, the pixel data is read out and then the pixels integrate all over the same time again. Alternatively, uh, most uh, CMOS sensors use a rolling shutter uh, where a, uh, a, a row of pixels uh, integrates and then that row is read out and the next row integrates and um, then there can be a, a readout time that uh, has varying type, various types of structure. So this is to um, match the efficiency. The, 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 uh, the pixel system uh, is very uh, simple. Typically, you might only have uh, uh, two or th uh, three or four uh, transistors at each pixel, and then those are read out over a, a row and bus uh, architecture, as was shown in the slide from, from Lucid in the, in the introduction. Um, typically, um, the rows are read sequentially uh, for no reason that makes any sense. 
Uh, you could read the rows in an interlay strategy, as was done uh, with uh, early uh, NTSC analog television. Uh, that actually improves the effective temporal resolution because as you look at the sampling in the uh, in the uh, time space data cube, you can see that the, the you have uh, fewer gaps, that the, the sampling density is, is more packed. Um, we have a uh, GitHub notebook on the or a, a Jupyter notebook on the GitHub site uh, that plays around with uh, what happens with sampling strategies for rolling in global shutter. Just imagining that we could make uh, variations on how the data is uh, sampled and uh, and then presented uh, from uh, um, from image sensors. Uh, here's an example from this notebook, a simple simulation to illustrate some of the, the challenges of these sampling strategies. So uh, we have a signal that we uh, imagine as having a space-time structure. So there's a two-dimensional signal just for simplicity in space uh, and time. And so you know we have something that's moving in, in, in space here as a function of, of time. If we sample with a global shutter, that means we take uh, particular times and sample all of the, uh, you know, laterally across space all at that one registered time. Um, and then uh, that in, in this particular case, if we assume the sampling pattern looks like this, from this signal, this would be what the measurements look like. Now, what's done uh, when after we have measurements is we assume that the measurements um, are taken in a frame. And so the, the display in, of the global shutter system would be exactly the same as the measurements. So that we, we don't see the con smooth continuous signal, we see these samples. Now. The same as we saw with uh, spatial measurements, um, the best display would not actually be uh, the, the raw sample data. It would be better to uh, upsample, to interpolate, to get a more accurate representation. And we could do uh, Lanxos or Shannon sampling, or we could use the kind of neural sampling strategies uh, that we talked about for pixel super resolution. Those same exact strategies should apply for uh, temporal sampling as well. We haven't done that here. We've just done display. Uh, we just displayed the raw data. Now, if we had a rolling shutter where we're going to measure diagonal slices in time as shown here, we get data that looks like uh, this. Now, the rolling shutter actually uh, represents the data better if, because we, we have, we, the, the, the pixels, are, we know the time that they're measured. So if we represent them at the time that they're measured, uh, the rolling shutter shows the dynamics of this uh, somewhat uh, more effectively, in, to, to my view. We'll, we'll get into some discussion of that in a second. The problem with the rolling shutter is that um, in conventional systems, the rolling shutter along one diagonal is displayed at a, all at a common time, as though this was one frame. So this measured data is distorted to look uh, like what you see here. And now uh, it looks you know, similar in sampling density to the uh, global shutter. Uh, but also it's distorted, that we've put a deliberate distortion on our sample data just uh, for convenience of displaying the frames. If we do the interlaced uh, rolling shutter, which is this bottom uh, plot down here, where we, we've uh, sampled a, a row and then we sample uh, the faraway row and come back and interlace, we get even a better representation of the underlying signal in our raw sample data uh, than we get from the global shutter or the standard rolling shutter. But again, if you take that and display it, um, as, uh, as, as though each frame was captured at the same time, you've put a deliberate distortion on the, um, on, on the uh, representation of the signal. So clearly uh, what's needed here is not uh, a change, you know, uh, the use of global shutter all the time. What's needed is a strategy that represents the data as the data was actually uh, sampled and, and gives the best estimate of the signal from the underlying uh, me measurements rather than some arbitrary display strategy. There's been some, some great work around this. Uh, um, NVIDIA has led the way uh, with a demonstration of uh, neural interpolation, as I'll show you in the short YouTube clip in the next slide. These are uh, results posted on YouTube by the group uh, from NVIDIA, uh, University of California, Merced, and Amherst. Uh, we see a standard 30 frame per second video, and then we compare that with uh, linear interpolation to higher frame rate uh, versus neural interpolation uh, to six times uh, higher frame rate, and you see, you know, much smoother motion in the neural interpolated data. As with, uh, you know, spatial sampling uh, over time, it, all, it, it always makes sense to upsample the data if you want to display it as well as possible. But which upsampling uh, method you use, whether you use uh, Langsos or linear or neural, will make a big difference. And you see here that the, the neural interpolation uh, helps a lot. But it also matters how you sample the data. So let's look at uh, different sampling strategies as well. 
For example, here we visually compare uh, interlaced uh, rolling shutter sampling with uh, random pixel sampling. So here's uh, the, the frame uh, time again, and here's the, the pixel. In the, the uh, rolling shutter, we have a very structured uh, approach of uh, you know, first measuring uh, this pixel, then measuring down, and and then going back up to this pixel, uh, and so on. Uh, here we've just uh, randomly sampled the pixels in, in some uh, uh, um, inter interlaced uh, strategy. Um, we could analyze uh, the quality of the sampling we get uh, using the principal component or other kinds of uh, feature-based analytical methods uh, like we discussed in the last two episodes. Uh, and, you know, again, we would want to design the sampling strategy to uh, capture as well as we can uh, the underlying features of most interest uh, in the in, in the measurement system, and you know that's that's really one of the challenges with event-based cameras is you know, the features have been kind of arbitrarily chosen. It would be better to have uh, imaging systems that could capture uh, space-time features that are most indicative of what we're looking for in the underlying video. We can see compare as a very simple test qualitatively, you know, the quality of measurement systems just again by looking at uh, how this what the sample data looks like. Uh, here we have, again, this kind of uh, weird uh, space-time signal at the top, and we, we're look, comparing what the sample data looks like distributed in space and time for the interlaced rolling shutter and for the random sampling. And basically, when you look at the random sampling, you, you can see uh, the structure of the signal you know, a lot more clearly in this kind of randomly distributed sampling than when you see in uh, you know, structured sampling. And so uh, this idea of uh, you know, increasing the packing density to improve sampling uh, is a core idea in improving temporal sampling. Uh, this is looked at in this uh, paper from Esteban Vera's uh, group, uh, where he looks at uh, you know, ways to uh, uh, cycle through the pixels in an image sampler in ways that pack uh, the samples in the uh, uh, space-time data cube more effectively. And here he's comparing you know, the packing density of the uh, samples in space and time uh, for a, uh, a, a random strategy and then a, a design strategy that tries to optimize this packing density. Uh, Vera's group then uh, went and looked at uh, estimators for these strategies. So, you know, at the, at the top here we see a, a simulated image of a, a fan blade uh, sampled and displayed under the traditional rolling shutter strategy. Uh, column B is, is the, the ground truth. Uh, C is the uh, estimate. Uh, from a nearest neighbor estimator and then uh, from a uh, uh, constrained optimization strategy in, in column D and using a neural estimator in uh, column E. And what you can see is that, you know, the, as, as you uh, improve the sampling strategy to uh, more efficiently uh, pack, in this case, the space-time data cube, but if there were particular features that you were looking for, uh, you could design the, the, the sampling to optimize sensitivity to those features and then try to estimate uh, those features or the underlying image by these kind of neural strategies. Uh, here's uh, more data from uh, uh, Vera's group uh, showing, uh, uh, you know, sampling strategies uh, and, and, and reconstructions uh, with this uh, uh, neural estimator. So the, the underlying uh, problem that we try to get to here is that definitely, you know, the current model for how uh, image sensors measure time is, is deeply flawed. Uh, we have this, uh, um, you know, dead time basically that uh, you have in the uh, rolling shutter case, a, uh, uh, you know, each line is red and then sequentially and you see all this white region is time when, when data is not being uh, uh, captured by the, by the image sensor, which drastically degrades the effective uh, quantum efficiency. Same is true with the global shutter, that you know, the, the time that's dead is, is different. But basically, nothing that happens in this time is sensed by global shutter, at least with the rolling shutter. Uh, there is no time when nothing is being sampled. But at the same time, it's, it's not an efficient way to measure the underlying uh, data cube. So uh, change is needed here, and uh, and hopefully uh, change change will come. Uh, in the meantime, uh, actually, you know, there's a preference, generally speaking, for people to say, "Well, I want global shutter to to uh, fully, um, you know, to to have well registered time data." Uh, for for a computational imaging perspective, uh, rolling shutter is actually you know somewhat better because you can get the uh, you, you have a, a more uh, sensitivity to temporal variation if you use the appropriate uh, estimators. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, again, the point here is just to uh, help you think about uh, what the optimal strategy might be and come up with strategies. And then after you come up with the best strategy here, unfortunately, you might have to spend a few million dollars to make a sensor uh, that mimics your strategy. 
Uh, next time we'll talk about uh, the uh, Another core challenge with, with sensors, which is dynamic range, uh, which is one of the reasons that this dead time is particularly um, disappointing in sensors, because uh, the more time that could be spent sensing pixels uh, to improve uh, estimation, uh, the better. Our current sensors are, are typically limited to uh, 8 bits or 12 bits of, uh, of um, uh, t intensity range, and that intensity range has to be spread over the entire image. So when you have uh, bright parts of an image, those, those have to, under the current frame-based model have to have the same exposure time as, as darker parts. And so you get this challenge as shown in this, this image, uh, that either the, the uh, you know, foreground will be too dark or the background will be blown out. So we'll talk about uh, multi-frame and multi-sensor strategies for overcoming this challenge in our next episode.